Welcome to the Leverage Your Potential podcast. This podcast is hosted by the director and assistant director of Menlo College's Office of Internships, Career Services, and Study Abroad, Dylan Hull and Kelly Davis, in partnership with Menlo's Content Creation Club. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Leverage Your Potential, the Office of Internships, Career Services, and Study Abroad podcast. I'm very pleased as your host today, Kelly Davis, to bring with us Tess Ruick, who is the Associate Director of Enrollment and Marketing at Menlo College. She's also a designated school official, so many of our international students will recognize her and her name. Uh, welcome to the show, Tess. So glad to have you here. Thank you so much, Kelly. Happy to be here. Marvelous. So what we're going to be focusing on today is we're going to talk to us a little bit about her career pathway up until this point here working at Menlo College. And then she is currently working on an online master's program in communication. So we're going to be asking her a little bit about that. But just to start us off, Tess, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and your role here at Menlo College, that would be excellent. Okay, great. So as you mentioned, I am Associate Director of Enrollment and Marketing. I work for the Office of Enrollment Management, which is comprised of admissions and financial aid. I oversee all of the mass email and mass text campaigns that we do with uh, prospective students. And I'm part of our social media and communications team. I help oversee all of the organic and paid content you see across the social media platforms. I make updates to our website, um, other operational data entry type tasks for the admissions office. And then, as you mentioned, I am one of the designated school officials. So one of the international advisors on campus. And for our audience, can you tell them how long you've been working at Menlo now? I have been working at Menlo a little over four years now. It's a long time. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, as, as it's very clear, when I first came to Menlo, which was almost two years ago, um, got a little few more months before I hit that mark, but when I first came to Menlo, I think that I remember meeting you and I remember many people, quote unquote, were different, many different hats. Right. But that mm -hmm. was what I remember uh, being told about you specifically was that right. you wore many different hats and you didn't even have the DSO role at that time. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, I yes, I've definitely worn many different hats, but it's always been an exciting adventure and I love to learn new things. And so um, just being a part of the Menlo community has meant a lot the last four years and I'm, you know, super excited to, to see where we go from here as well. Totally. Yeah. So uh, going back a little bit, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you went to high school, um, believe it was in Hawaii, and then you went on to study business at Linfield College, which is also a very small college, uh, the undergraduate size is about twice as much as Menlo, which is still extremely small in the higher education landscape. So if you can tell us a bit about where you came from and then why you ended up choosing a small college and studying business at that small college. Yeah, so I was born and grew up in Hawaii. I attended Punahou School and I actually went to that school for 13 years, so kindergarten through high school. Um, lived in the same house all of my life too, so when it came time to look for colleges, I was ready for something new. I was ready to, you know, go on a new adventure. I decided specifically to look at the Pacific Northwest for school options. I couldn't really tell you why. I think it's because it was so different than Hawaii in terms of weather, mm. uh, but still close enough that I was only, you know, a single flight away 
from home. And I think the community on the West Coast, for the most part, is very similar to the Hawaii community. So I started looking for schools in Washington and Oregon. I was lucky enough to be able to visit a number of schools um, on a kind of college trip my junior year with my dad. And Linfield was the one that stood out the most when I stepped foot on campus. It felt like home and I felt like I could see myself there for four years. Um, it is a small private college. I only looked at small private colleges. I wanted to be able to have the opportunity to be a big fish in a little pond or just at the very least not get lost in you know the hustle and bustle of everything and I was able to get really involved on campus um, which I don't know if I would have been able to do because I am a very introverted person and I was very shy in high school so I'm glad that I was able to kind of blossom in college and I worked for the admissions office. I was actually hired coming in as a freshman to be a student ambassador. And so I gave campus tours and processed applications and um, did a number of things that I actually still use in, in my current role. Um, and then I additionally got involved with the residence life staff and, and was an RA for a couple of years and was a peer advisor. So it was a really amazing time. Um, I will say that the weather ended up taking a toll on me. I definitely dreaded the winters because they were harsh and, and Oregon is beautiful in the summer and fall, but in the winter it can be pretty miserable at times. You don't see the sun a lot. Um, that being said, it was still a very valuable experience. I also had the opportunity to study abroad twice while I was in college and that's something that I highly recommend to any student if they are able to. I spent a semester in Oaxaca, Mexico and I was able to spend a month in uh, England as well. Oh, that's super cool. Yeah. Well, you know me, always the proponent of any mm -hmm. <laughs> study abroad experiences, but that's really incredible. Thanks for sharing a little bit about Linfield. I think that a lot of Menlo students could probably really identify with what you were describing in terms of what you were aiming for when you were looking at small private colleges. But I think our, our Oaks ambassadors are probably also going, oh, Tessa's like me. Right. <laughs> That's great. So you ended up studying business. What kind of led you to pick that major, which is another thing. 90% of our students will identify with, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So part of it was just the courses seemed interesting. Um, I, like Menlo, Linfield did, does have a liberal arts foundation and I had to take a number of just general education courses. And so the ones that were part of the business program were the ones that attracted my attention the most. Um, I did double minor in Spanish and anthropology as well. So I think a combination of the three, just it appealed to me the most at the time. Um, and then also with business, I, looking towards the future, I figured that would give me the best leg up in, because I, I did not want to move back in with my parents after graduating um, as much as possible, even though at that time, um, that unfortunately was, unfortunately or fortunately, um, but it was a reality for a lot of my peers. And so I was just looking for a program that could give me the soft skills, critical thinking skills, which I think that you can find in a lot of academic programs, but also the just skills that are transferable to a variety of organizations and lines of business. And then plus it, it aligned to with my kind of goal at that point to work for um, the, for Disney. Oh, that's super interesting. And I like what you were saying about skills. Um, it sounds really like you were just trying to 
keep a lot of options and opportunities open even beyond your degree. Exactly. Nice. And so you did end up going and working for Disney World for mm -hmm. a few years. So how did, it's really cool, you accomplished that goal right away. How did you end up working there? You had a couple of roles. What were, what was kind of the, the, the pathway, so to speak, of obtaining those roles? And what do you feel like you learned in that experience? Mm -hmm. So I, from a very young age, knew that I wanted to work for Disney at some point in my life. I was very fortunate in that I was able to go to both Disneyland and Disney World um, numerous times as a child. I'm an only child, and so I think that, you know, my parents, you know, I was spoiled in that regard, and I acknowledged that um, instead of, you know, doing lavish Christmas or birthday gifts, we would do Disney trips, and I in college um, was able to go to Walt Disney World on a vacation and there we did a, a backstage tour of the Magic Kingdom and the tour guide was telling me all about this uh, program called the Disney College Program which was an internship program that he had gone on and then proceeded to get a job from and become a tour guide and, and work in the Magic Kingdom. And I thought, you know what? I want to do that. So I'm going to follow the same path. And I looked into the Disney College program more. I spoke with the career services department, the Dylan equivalent <laughs> at Linfield, <Yeah. laughs> about this program to see if any other Linfield students had done it before. And um, they told me that yes, however, they recommended finishing college first and then doing the program because the program allows you to um, apply the semester right after you graduate in addition to, of course, applying while you are still in school. They do offer some courses, but none of them were transferable to Linfield. So that's why they suggested, mm -hmm. you know, why don't you just wait I don't want you to put a hold on your degree, finish your degree, apply, and then just start working there right after you graduate, which was the best advice I could have gotten. And I actually gave that advice to um, quite a few friends who ended up doing the Disney College program after me because I met people on the program who took a break from their college experience to go do this program and then never went back. And it has, it has hurt them in terms of trying to advance their careers with the company and not having that bachelor's. But mm -hmm. anyway, I applied and got in and I was selected for the line of business called Attractions, um, which is the rides and um, basic operations of the park. And I, was put to work at, uh, I don't know how familiar you are, Kelly, with the Disney rides, but there's an attraction called Toy Story Midway Mania. That's a Toy Story ride that is kind of like a, a video game ride. So while you're on the ride, you're playing various games with the Toy Story characters and it's in 3D um, and it's a lot of fun, but not what I expected as a first job out of college, pushing buttons, checking lap bars, handing out right. you know, 3D glasses. Um, I do highly recommend to, to any person though, to try a job in the service industry at least once, mm -hmm. because let me tell you the, the skills and the interactions that you have the challenges that you face, you can apply those to any future work. And it's, it's really hard work and it can be really thankless at times, but at the same time, incredibly valuable because it helps you kind of reframe your thinking. Uh, you know, you have to do a lot of problem solving very quickly, especially working, you know, in a theme park where you're seeing 30,000 plus people daily um, and, and yeah. with so many people from so many different parts 
of the world. Uh, so that in and of itself was incredibly valuable and while tiring and terrible at times, also, you know, wonderful and, and magical. And so then I ended up staying on. I did a second internship in this role that's called guest relations, which is essentially customer service and pretty much stayed there, became status in that position and then was able to move. Disney has a lot of opportunities to move laterally. So I became a what's called a coordinator. It's essentially like a shift supervisor for that position. I also was able to teach courses at Disney University, which what I basically did was all of the onboarding training for that specific role. So for that guest relations position, which included history of the company, ticket sales, how to problem solve, um, how to uh, you know address the guest concern. Of course, Disney teaches this to other um, businesses because their their guest services are pretty much unmatched. Um, and, right. And then um, from there, I additionally became a tour guide, and so I got to lead those same backstage tours of the Magic Kingdom, like that guide that. I had had years prior um, and I was a VIP <laughs> tour guide for a short tenure as well. That's so cool. He totally yeah. inspired you and you got to realize that that what you envisioned at such a young age. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting, I met somebody about a year ago who I don't know if she did the same program, but she was she was an intern for Disney and I, I think I might have asked her how it was or something like that. And She's like, you know, I have gained so much respect for their customer service because it is all about making sure that these families who have saved up for years to get their whole family have just the best time and that anything that goes wrong for a moment is fixed. And, and that was so interesting to, to hear and to think about because they really do want you to, you know, have this experience where you're like that was the happiest place on earth and um and then a lot of respect for the customer and what they're what they're doing to get there in the first place oh absolutely so wait yeah part what of you're the, saying is the training for that for the the guest relations position that i was in we do an exercise where you will go through what the average cost of a, a Disney family vacation looks like. And I mean, that that final number is pretty significant. And so like you just said, when you put it into perspective, how much these families are, are paying for these, these trips and, and that a lot of them have probably saved up for years and years and years to be able to do this. Um, that helps put in perspective when then you're put into a situation where you're standing and, and someone is yelling at you because XYZ went wrong and mm. you're trying to figure out, okay, why is this person this upset about, you know, an ice cream cone falling on the ground or, you know, about a ride. Which is exactly what I was envisioning. <laughs> right. um, and so it, it does, it, it puts it into perspective for sure. And Disney follows with their, with their, customer relations, something called the last model, which came from, I, it was some video that they had us watch. And I'm not even sure if it was Disney made, but it was this, this really funny video from like the nineties. And it was this gentleman modeling something called the last model, which is to listen, apologize, solve, and thank. Um, so when you're dealing with an irate, customer or guest, you listen to their problem, you listen to their issue, you let them vent a little bit, you apologize. You don't have to take personal responsibility, but you know, you can sympathize with them and then you find a solution to their problem. But then the very last piece, which not a lot of people do, but you should, is, is thank them for bringing this to your attention. And um, yeah, I, I try and, and use that actually still in my current position and um, just in, you know, regular daily interactions as well. 
Absolutely. That sounds useful in any circumstance. Mm -hmm. Certainly customer service, but I don't know, dealing with friends and family who are are just upset about something. And I don't know, I'm one of those people who uh, can on occasion jump to trying to solve the problem when it's a little too early to be thinking about that. So (laughs) good to remember the, the sequence and order of things. Well, so you had this great experience at uh, Walt Disney World, um, and then you ended up coming here to Menlo. So what happened in that transition, and and what uh, kind of catalyzed it? Yes. I had been at Disney for a little over three years, and I started itching for a change. I had gotten to a point with the company that I could move into potentially a management position, but it would be within park operations. And it was still gonna take some time because there were quite a few ahead of me um, who were gonna be going that direction. So frankly, it it was more just, okay, I wanna try um, to have more of a, a supervisor management type role Um, and hopefully do it a little bit quicker than than having to wait it out for a few more years um, at Disney. Plus, my family were living in, or are currently still living in Oregon. So my parents moved to Oregon right after I graduated college, um, and I just wanted to be closer to them. It was tough being all the way over on the East Coast when all of my family were back on the west coast or in hawaii so i started looking for positions on the west coast and i did look at positions with disney but i kind of opened it up a bit and started looking for higher education positions um, specifically in admissions or student affairs offices because that's where you know it was paraprofessional experience but that's where at least i had some experience and Menlo popped up on my radar and so I googled it and thought oh wow this is this school is similar to the school that I attended they offer business programs which is exactly what I you know got my degree in and I started thinking to myself first off why did I not know about Menlo when I was in high school because I (laughs) definitely would have applied um, Maybe better I, weather. Exactly. I love the Bay Area. I had an aunt who lived in Castro Valley for like well over 30 years. And, and so I was very familiar with the Bay Area. I always wanted to live in San Francisco. But I think it was just, again, going back to when I was in high school, I was so set on Pacific Northwest that I, for whatever reason, wasn't looking at schools in California. But now I was and and so I applied for the position that they had posted and I I got a call from Ken Bowman Um, we lovingly refer to him as Bo our director of admissions operations and I was pretty much sold from that phone call he was super excited to to speak with me apparently they had just lost their their person who was recruiting for the Hawaii territory and so he was excited that I was from Hawaii he told me this really funny story about my high school he was like I know Punahou I went to visit there once and I had gone swimming the day before and there was water in my ear and they took me to your health center and they put rocks on my ear <laughs> I was, you know, I said, what is he talking about but I think they they had put like hot stones on his ear to try and help, you know, extract the water. But he just thought that was the wildest thing um, and still, ha- you know, held that memory from how many years prior. And, and then I was able to interview with Priscilla, who is our, our Dean of Enrollment. And they offered me a position that was essentially an admissions counselor for the Um, Hawaii territory and then overseeing the student ambassador program so very much in line with my experience and I decided you know what I'm going to take it and move out to the Bay Area. Wow that's really cool and you just I mean I've done the move back and forth between the east and west coasts and it's 
a big one. Really, yes. <laughs> and yeah, my, it was, my dad and I drove my car over to Florida um, because I had purchased a car while in college. And then um, I actually flew back and then my wonderful, amazing father drove my car from Florida to California for me, which was Oh my crazy. gosh. What an awesome dad. <laughs> oh, that's so great. Well, we're obviously happy that you're here at Menlo. Um, so it's such a, it's very neat to, to hear your story of what, what happened before. Um, so we're going to fast forward a little bit more to the present. You are nearing completion now of your online master of science program in communication. Uh, and you're doing this with Purdue University, which interestingly, I think they're quite renowned for how they've been able to widen access, especially um, in their surrounding area, but clearly they, their reach goes uh, far beyond um, just their uh, geographic region. Um, so that's, that's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. But why did you choose to pursue a master's in communication? And so ignoring the online part, but just specifically this, this, um, this type of master's, and how do you hope, what do you hope it will serve for you after you've completed it? So really, it, it just felt like the right time for me. Um, I, I knew when I was getting my bachelor's that I didn't want to go straight into getting my master's after um, graduating, mostly because, again, I, I was just ready for a change, and I was so set on working for Disney that I thought, okay, I'll just go out and get some real world experience. And then if and when the time comes, I'll, I'll go back to it. And so I've been thinking about it for a couple of years after starting at Menlo and decided, you know, I'm, I'm gonna go for this. Um, a little part of my decision too is even, we offer uh, a couple of one unit courses at, at Menlo. There's a kind of introduction to, to college course that has always fascinated me and I would love to be able to facilitate that. But one of the limitations mm. is that you need to have a, a master's degree to be able to teach. Um, so I thought, oh, well, I'll go and get this master's. In terms of the specific program that I chose, I had considered an MBA, but ultimately Finance and accounting, unfortunately, are not my strong suit. And so I was looking for programs that would still align, be within that business realm, but align more with what I currently do um, and offer opportunities to be able to apply what I'm learning in class directly to my current work. So that's where a communications degree came in because it is very similar to marketing. Um, and being able to just kind of see everything from a bird's eye view is what I was looking for. And then maybe within those classes that I, that I took, kind of narrow down where I want to go with my career, um, you know, with regards to communications and marketing. Sure. Do you think that's helped at all in that regard? Or do you, maybe you need more reflection after the program's over? had a little bit more space it, have you come up with any answers I guess to those questions about how it defines might define your career moving forward I think that it has helped me figure out some of the things I don't want to do um, and that's important too <laughs> so which I don't know if I really want to speak to because one of the courses that I'm in currently is one of the things that I don't want to do so I don't uh, you no know, worries all of a, a certain class but I, it is going to take a little bit of reflection after I finish the program to figure it out. That being said, um, I've definitely been able to apply concepts and things that I've learned in, in classes directly to my work at Menlo, which has been great. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, looking forward, I still have a few more classes left. So looking forward to some that had interested me from the get-go that I just haven't been able to, to take yet. Yeah, and how long have you been working on this again? When did you start? I started last summer, so the program 
I guess for me will be about 18 months. Yeah. Okay. And, and it's an online program. So why did you opt to do this program online? So I was a little nervous, but I just figured with my work schedule that online would be the best fit for me. I already detest commuting as it is. <laughs> um, so having to then also yeah, sure. <laughs> drive in Bay Area traffic to a school, you know, because there are a lot of wonderful institutions in this area that offer great competitive master's programs, but it just that that wasn't going to be it for me. So that's when I started looking online. Um, and I did want a school that had a lot of name recognition for my master's degree. So that's where Purdue popped up. Nice. And how has that experience been in the in terms of doing all of these online classes and thinking about uh, our students now who are did not opt for an online program, but that's what we have to do in this in this moment in time. And um, what are some of the challenges that you faced as an online student? How did you manage to adapt to those to those changes? So online is is tough, especially when my previous classroom experiences from even high school on were all in person small classes the professor knew me you know by name but also knew like my likes and dislikes and about my family and and you really developed relationships with your classmates and faculty where it's more challenging to do that you know in an online environment um, and I haven't really been able, I, I think that I've, I've been able to do that with the faculty because they go out of their way to, you know, send you emails and, and give you constant feedback, which I appreciate. But in terms of the classmates, so how my program is set up, we have um, weekly discussion post assignments and then additional papers and, and a final project. And it's basically been the same design for every course that I've, I've taken so far. So with those discussion posts, that's where you interact the most with your fellow classmates. Um, but again, it's all asynchronous work. So it's not like everyone's online at the same time. I post something, someone responds to my post, I maybe see it a couple of days later and then can you know continue the thread or choose not to continue the thread um, so it's really interesting to learn about all of my colleagues and you know the different industries they're in and what they do but i i still don't really feel like i've made those personal connections like i did you know in college where i have friendships that you know i was just a bridesmaid in a wedding in February for you know one of my, my best friends from Linfield so that has been different but overall this the schedule has worked um, for me and it's the, the work is manageable too which is good um, my program is very much just a lot of reading and writing uh, but that's my strong suit and and that's kind of where I thrive so I like writing a lot. I, I don't like multiple choice exams. Uh, <laughs> so it, it's been good overall. It, it is just different and it, it took some adjusting for sure. Yeah, I hear you there. Um, it's, it's really interesting what you say about the, I think the connections between you and your classmates. So I think that's something that people are really most worried about well i mean i guess it d depends on who you are um but my sister she's a junior at occidental college and we were talking about my cousin who's going to be a freshman mm -hmm. this upcoming fall and um he's going to go to boulder and, and do their astrophysics program but um 
and she, my sister was just like, oh my gosh, I feel so bad for Ryan. That would be horrible to have your first semester all online where you're not meeting people. And it's mm -hmm. like, okay, it's not, it's not the experience that most college freshmen have, but I don't know, maybe, maybe it would make meeting those people the following semester that much better or something. I mean, we just don't know, right? And, but it's, it's still that human connection I don't think can quite be replaced. And it also called to mind um, a friend of mine uh, who's getting his PhD in psychology uh, at Alto University. He was telling me, I think he had a professor in college who said, the reason why you're here is not because of the content we're teaching you, it's because of the network you're building, the people you're meeting. So I think that's really what the, the concern is in terms of if things, you know, this whole movement uh, for online education in the higher education sector, um, that's what the fear is. Now, I don't think we're all going to be online forever, but it's just interesting to think of that. Um, nonetheless, students who are listening in, you're not going to always be no. attending online. <laughs> Well, that's not what it was about so no it's not, absolutely not um and when you are put in positions like that that's where you do need to apply those skills those networking skills that you've gained from your previous courses that you know were in person and, and from those opportunities that you had on campus and it's something that i need to practice more myself because again you know i'm saying like oh it's so you know it's tough for me to make these connections but it's like tess why haven't you added all of these people on linkedin why haven't you reached out outside of class to try and make the connection you know i need mm. to hold myself a little bit accountable too it's just i'm not used to it because i'm used to a, a completely different type of experience you know where that was all laid out for me and it's one of those like, oh, wow, you don't, you kind of don't know what you had until, until it's gone. Um, yeah, no, totally. I mean, I don't think any of us are really used to it. We have, I'm part of this NAFSA Academy, and I feel like even though I was having these, I had a couple calls with my smaller cohort. It wasn't until I met, got to meet them all in person. Mm -hmm. This was early March. It was just in time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um it wasn't until we had, and I'm so grateful that it was just in time because meeting face to face, I feel like then it opens the floodgate almost. You feel more comfortable going, let me connect with these people on LinkedIn. Let me reach out to them via phone just to chat about something. But you're right in that what the situation does bring about is that we have to get over that somehow and we have to, we have to make the, the moves. Um, so thank you so much for sharing all of that. I think it's really valuable for for students. Well, I we've covered a lot of ground today uh, and I, we're coming up to time. So I wanted to wrap things up by asking you what we're asking um, all of our, all our guests and we're asking them if there's a book you're reading or a podcast you're listening to or any TV series or movies that you think would be interesting for students. And I can only imagine that as both a full-time employee and working on a master's, you probably don't have a lot of time where you're like, yeah, let me just sit down and read this book. Right. <laughs> so I think, I think that's first. I remember being, uh, getting my degrees and I just mm -hmm. couldn't think beyond what do you mean read something else? Right. I would love that, but I can't. Um, but what's something that you're doing outside of all of that that you want to share? Um, so currently, yeah, like, like you said, it, really when I have my downtime, it's mostly just trying to get outside as much as possible. Um, and then to admit it but you know a lot of just streaming netflix or hulu trying to turn my brain off a little but still finding totally. content of course um i just finished actually the documentary i don't know if you've seen it yet mcmillions 
it's an HBO documentary, but they have it free right now. So I actually found it on Hulu, um, but it's about the, are you familiar with the McDonald's um, Monopoly game? So it's somewhat, I think I've heard yeah. about this, but yeah, keep, keep telling us more. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it, oh my gosh, it was so interesting. So they're in the late eighties, all the way through like 2001, there was this network of people who were scamming that McDonald's Monopoly game. Um, there was a gentleman who worked security for the marketing company that McDonald's used and he was stealing the, the winning game pieces and then selling them um, to various people. And I mean, they pretty much like, it was like 24, $25 million that they effectively stole. Um, but the FBI was made aware of it in the late 90s and they, did this whole sting operation where FBI agents posed as a film crew and went and interviewed all of these winners and collected all of this information and, and did, you know, taps on their phones and were able to get all this evidence. And they worked with um, the one who now I believe is like the chief marketing op officer for McDonald's, but at the time, she, you know, was just in her 20s and, and working in the communications department and, um, and then got to be part of a legitimate FBI operation. And it's just, I mean, it's a wild story. I know everyone is obsessed with Tiger King, but I think this story is way more fascinating and um, just, yeah, very interesting to see how it all unfolds. And it was kind of out of the news just because of when it when it went to trial it went to trial I believe on September 12th 2001 so you know oh wow it, just wasn't, yeah. it wasn't um at the top of of the news at that time people's minds exactly for sure. but it's a yeah it's a very interesting story um so I highly recommend that documentary for sure well, thank you for that. Uh, I myself have watched five episodes of Tiger King, got three more to go, and I don't know what I'm going to do afterwards, I but now I, now I do know. So. Yeah. <laughs> Did you listen to the, the podcast, though, about Joe Exotic? Because I do recommend that as well. I, I thoroughly enjoy Tiger King, but the Wondery podcast that they did on him um, was, that, that's, what made me aware of the story initially. So I was telling all of my friends, okay, there's this wild story about this guy in Oklahoma who owns this zoo and everyone, you know, just <laughs> wouldn't listen to me about this. And then the documentary came out on Netflix. Um, but I do recommend that podcast as well. Oh, wow. Yeah, for some extra information, for sure. Look at you, yeah. Tess, ahead of the curve on that one. <laughs> You get more insight into Joe Exotic's background and girls, too. Wow. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'm psyched. Cool. <laughs> more, more to learn, more to understand. <laughs> um, well, Tess, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure to have you and to learn a little bit more about your career journey and what might be happening moving forward with this uh, new master's. Thank you, Kelly. This was really fun and I really appreciate that your department is offering this for our students. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Leverage Your Potential podcast. Episodes are posted weekly and can be found on our blog at blog.menlo.edu slash career dash services slash. Make it a great day.